Iceland is a country of big volcanoes, big glaciers, and the largest single colony of puffins in the world. Lots of puffins. But the country itself is not all that big. With an area of around 100,000 square kilometers, Iceland is roughly the same size as South Korea or the state of Kentucky, but with a much smaller population compared to both. In fact, with a total population of only 370,000 people, the number of tourists in Iceland sometimes outnumber Icelanders 7 to 1, thanks to a bonkers rise in tourism starting in the early 2000s. But of those almost 400,000 people, how religious is Icelandic society? For the past few decades, the Nordic countries have developed a bit of a reputation for being overwhelmingly secular countries, places where organized religion has dramatically dropped in overall numbers and societal influence. But is this true? Today we're examining the religious landscape of Iceland. Although we'll be focusing mostly on the 21st century, let's briefly sketch the religious history of Iceland. The story of religion on the island begins in the 9th century. The Icelandic sagas say that Irish Christian monks were the first to inhabit the island, for which there is some corroborating evidence. But settlement of Iceland really didn't take off until the late 9th century when Scandinavian settlers started to move in, bringing their traditional Norse paganism with them, which includes the worship of famous Norse gods like Odin and Thor. Archaeologists have found evidence of Norse pagan practice all over the island, including small finds such as this bronze figurine that may depict Thor grasping his hammer. Pagan burial sites have also given us a glimpse into ritual practice. Interestingly, 34% of the known Icelandic pagan burials contained horse remains, presumably sacrificed stallions, suggesting that this was a common mortuary practice in pre-Christian Iceland. The Old Norse word for sacrifice is blot, and sacrifices were conducted in temples or bloat houses. The Icelandic sagas describe these temples, their locations, and their layouts, but there really is not much conclusive archaeological evidence for these structures in Iceland. One possible candidate is the 10th century Viking settlement at Hofstadir located in northeastern Iceland. The main hall discovered there was unusually large, and some archaeologists think that it was some sort of cultic site. Excavations around the building revealed 23 cattle skulls, which show evidence that they were decapitated, possibly evidence for sacrifices combined with feasting. So the first 100 years of Icelandic religious history was overwhelmingly Norse pagan. However, in the year 999 or 1000, after decades of Christian missionary activity and pressure from the king of Norway, Way, Olaf I, the Icelandic General Assembly officially adopted Christianity as the religion of the land. Because of this, the adoption of Christianity in Iceland is sometimes described as a largely peaceful and largely political decision that occurred suddenly. But societal change is never so clean. Archaeological evidence suggests that Christianization was a much more gradual process, with Icelanders negotiating the transition on a local and even individual level, sometimes mixing their pagan culture with Christianity. Christianity, sometimes adopting Christianity whole cloth. Regardless, the religious landscape eventually shifted to Christianity. According to one historian, it was a shift from the relatively decentralized and local practice of paganism to a hierarchically organized and institutionalized Christian church, specifically Catholicism. And if you know anything about the history of Christianity, you know this means that the church in Iceland was headed on a collision course with the Protestant Reformation, which had huge implications for Christianity in Iceland that continued to be felt into the 21st century. The major major player in the Icelandic Reformation was this guy, King Christian III of Denmark. He was a staunch Lutheran, and starting in the late 1530s, tried to impose Lutheranism on his subjects, which included Icelanders. Lutheranism had already gained a foothold in Iceland by 1540, thanks to two men, the Lutheran bishop Gissur Einarsson, as well as Ottor Goldskogsson a scribe who translated the New Testament into Icelandic, reportedly doing so in secret under the nose of the Catholic bishop who employed him. Gisser opposed Catholicism and urged priests to adopt this new Icelandic translation of the New Testament. Some Catholic priests resigned, but many switched allegiances to Lutheranism. There were also frequent outbreaks of violence, like when a gang of King Christian's men raided the Catholic monastery on Vide, a small island off the coast of Reykjavik. When Gisser died in 1548, the Catholic bishop Jón Arason attempted one final push to re-establish Catholicism, but he and his sons were captured by King Christian's men and executed on November 7th, 1550. This is often marked as the symbolic end of the Icelandic Reformation, but as with the adoption of Christianity and the supposedly sudden end of paganism in the year 1000, 
big societal changes rarely hinge upon a single moment in time. Historians have pointed out that the Reformation continued to unfold for many decades to come. But to this day, Lutheranism remains the most prominent form of Christianity in Iceland. In fact, the official state church of Iceland is Lutheran. It's written into the country's constitution. And according to some measures, over 60% of Icelanders affiliate with the state church. However, as we'll see, this number glosses over the complexity of the current state of religion in Iceland. So let's map out that current religious landscape. Sociologists actually really like Iceland as a case study. At well under half a million people, the entire society is relatively small compared to other countries. Because of this, sociologists can track complex societal phenomena such as religion on a much more manageable scale. Now, as I've said in other videos, measuring religiosity is really difficult. To try to get a well-rounded picture of religiosity in a given population, I like to look at five dimensions of religiosity. First, religious self-identification, the amount of people who identify with a particular tradition. Next, there's public religious practice and private religious practice, which are fairly self-explanatory. The former measures rituals like attending a communal gathering on a particular day, like Christian church attendance on a Sunday, and the latter seeks to measure something like the frequency of prayer or some sort of religious devotion that you do at home with your family. Next is supernatural belief. How many people hold to supernatural worldviews that include belief in God, gods and spirits, or something like belief in the afterlife. And finally, self-reported importance of religion. This dimension tries to measure the intensity of religiosity, how strongly people hold to their beliefs, and even how extreme those beliefs are. Taken together, I think we can arrive at a fairly well-rounded picture of a given population's religiosity. So what do we learn when we apply these five dimensions to Iceland? Several studies seem to confirm that Iceland lives up to the Nordic reputation of being a highly secular society. First of all, we're witnessing a huge drop in affiliation with the state Lutheran church. In 1998, almost 90% of the Icelandic population were members of the Church of Iceland. This dropped to about 72% in 2016, and in only six years after that, dropped to about 61% in 2022. At the same time, we're seeing a huge rise in Icelanders who identify as not at all religious, from almost 5% in 2004 to almost 15% in 2016. Now, affiliation is measured primarily by rates of baptism, so the majority of Icelanders are still baptized their children into the state church, which is interesting because this would technically count as fairly high rates of public religious practice. But many Icelanders who baptize their kids rarely engage in church activities or private religious practice. Between 2004 and 2016, Icelanders who report never praying rose from 24% to 38%. Those who pray daily declined from 20% to 13%. Weekly church attendance has been dropping as well. So affiliation is declining, but many of the people who don't pray or don't attend church still decide to baptize their kids. This leads some sociologists to surmise that baptism retains some social importance for Icelanders even long after the average Icelander will have stopped displaying the attitudes and habits characteristic of a Christian believer. So Christianity remains influential when it comes to major life transition rituals like baptisms, weddings, and burials, but by most metrics, Iceland appears to be an increasingly secular society. But what about supernatural belief? And here's where things get a little sensational. You may have heard that Icelanders overwhelmingly believe in supernatural or paranormal beings like trolls, land spirits, and elves, called by their Icelandic name Hildavok or hidden people. Supposedly, the respect for these beings can be so strong that construction workers will build roads around where they supposedly dwell. When I was researching this episode, I found this topic to be too big and complex, so we'll save most of it for a future episode. But briefly, this narrative is inextricably linked with the tourism industry, and it's difficult to untangle fact from sensationalism based on the limited available data. Surveys conducted in 2006 and 2007 by the University of Iceland found that around 24% of Icelanders say it's likely or certain that elves exist. 36% consider their existence unlikely or impossible, but foreign journalists really latched onto the middle bunch in these surveys. Around 32% of respondents said that it's possible that elves exist. Often this figure is lumped in with the likely and certain groups, creating the impressive figure of 56% saying it's at least possible that elves exist. But this is a potentially misleading use of the results. 
possible can point toward ambivalence or agnosticism about these beings. The scholar Terry Gunnell, who's a folklore professor at the University of Iceland, says it more points to a hesitation to deny their existence. After all, hidden people and other beings from Icelandic folklore are part of a shared cultural memory and vocabulary. But the numbers are drastically smaller when the survey asked if people have ever personally experienced elves themselves, at 5% of respondents. And presumably that 5% would include people who position themselves as seers and mediums who can communicate with elves, a movement influenced by 19th century spiritualism and the 20th century New Age movement. But some Icelandic scholars, as well as many Icelanders in general, are very critical of how these studies have been used in the media, basically saying they've helped to create a cutesy trope that the Icelandic scholar Arman Jakobsen calls the Icelandic tourist elf. Terry Gunnell says this is one of the main topics that foreign journalists like to ask him, but he says he felt increasingly irritated with these journalists who seem to imagine every Icelandic house has an elf rock outside it and that Iceland stands out from the rest of Europe in its apparently stubborn or nostalgic wholesale belief that elves still exist and have regular contact with human beings. So while the 2007 survey may indicate a not insignificant rate of supernatural beliefs connected to Icelandic folklore, at least according to a 15-year-old study, Scholars like Arman and Gunnell caution us not to conflate these findings with the Icelandic tourist elf, and the assumption that these beliefs touch every aspect of Icelandic society. Even the Icelandic Road Administration laughs off the implication that this is a major factor in their decision-making process. In this interview with the BBC, the head of communication for the Road Administration says, while they did move a supposed elf rock to make room for a road, he says, if we couldn't have moved it, we would have smashed it down. By many other metrics, supernatural beliefs are dropping, especially when you factor in age demographics. Atheism is rising among younger Icelanders. According to a 2016 survey, only 12% of those older than 55 identify identified as atheist, compared to 40.5% of those 25 and younger. So religious affiliation, practice, and supernatural belief have dropped over the past few decades, with the added caveats that rates of supernatural beliefs connected to Icelandic folklore are not insignificant, and the state Lutheran church does remain influential for a majority of the population, especially with life cycle rituals like baptism, weddings, and funerals. However, at the same time, there's been a dramatic rise in non-Christian religions, particularly contemporary Norse paganism or Ausothru. Ausothru means the faith of the Aesir, the primary pantheon of Norse gods. One scholar calls Ausothru a religion with homework. Practitioners look to medieval Norse texts to reconstruct Icelandic pagan practice for the modern age, drawing especially from the Poetic Edda, a compendium of Old Norse poems which are often recited as part of their religious practice. Practitioners also hold ceremonies called blot, using the same word from Old Norse pagan practice but without the animal sacrifice. The largest Norse pagan organization in Iceland is called the Ausothru Fellowship. Founded in 1972, it has rapidly grown ever since. In 1998, they only had 280 members, but then in 2022, they hit a record high with 5,500 members. Now, this is less than 1.5% of the total population. So some might question whether the growth of Ausothru points to a significant shift in the broader Icelandic society, especially since these numbers do not offset the rise in religiously unaffiliated Icelanders. But sociologists have found that the Ausothru Fellowship in particular has managed to achieve some impressive degrees of social and public influence. Soon after its founding, the fellowship came to national attention as it lobbied to be recognized as an official religious organization by the state. Despite pushback from the state Lutheran Church, it won recognition in 1973 and celebrated the first openly pagan bloat in 1,000 years. Achieving official status had several important ramifications for Norse paganism. First, this meant that the priests gained the official right to carry out legally binding ceremonies such as weddings. It also meant that the fellowship earned the right to a share of state funds that the government collects via a church tax. Also called a parish fee, this is a portion of income tax revenue that goes to support religious associations in Iceland. The church tax was at the center of a controversy involving another contemporary pagan movement called Zuism. Zuism was founded sometime around 2010 as a new religion based on worshipping the Sumerian gods. In 2013, it gained official recognition by the state despite having less than five members. It reached national news following a leadership change in 2015 when the new leaders promised to reimburse members' church tax from the funds that the organization received from the government. 
The following year, in 2016, the number of members jumped to over 3,000 people, which has led critics to call the religion more of a protest movement against the church tax rather than an actual religion, an allegation that Zooist leadership disputes. In recent years, Zooism's membership has sharply declined to under 1,000 people, and Icelandic politicians have called for Zooism to be delisted as an official religious organization. The Zooism controversy highlights how religion and the government sometimes are a source of controversy in Iceland. A 2021 Gallup study showed only one-third of respondents have a lot of trust in the state church, and a 2016 poll found that 71% support the complete separation of church and state. So, though Christianity remains a powerful cultural influence in Iceland, the current trend suggests that Iceland may stand as a case study in the near future for what a secular country will look like after Christianity loses its historical dominance. A country characterized not by the wholesale disappearance of religion from public life, but rather a plurality of different religious and non-religious affiliations. Hey everyone, this is the first episode in a new ongoing series called How Religious is the World? Each episode will focus on a specific country, examining its recent religious history as well as its current religious landscape. Iceland was the first episode, but our patrons on Patreon will choose the next country. Should the next video be on Mexico or Japan? The poll is already up on Patreon, so if you'd like to vote, head on over to patreon.com slash religion for breakfast. Everyone at the $2 pledge level and above can access the poll. Thanks everyone.